here's what I'm going to talk about for the next two sessions. Um, I'll just, I suppose I'll leave it up here. I hope it's not distracting if it stays up there so that I don't have to pay attention to it anymore. Uh, what I'm hoping to do uh, for the next two sessions is to introduce a little bit the, uh, the, the modern day conflict between science and religion. Um, talk a little bit about its origin, talk a little bit about where I feel the roots of this conflict lie. And, uh, and then I'll talk about how different groups of people have responded um, to this, what I'll say, apparent contradiction between science and religion. Um, and in particular, I'll, I'll focus uh, on a group that in the United States, in any case, is, uh, and, and in the UK, is increasingly known as the new atheist, not that atheism is a new thing, uh, but that there's a, a new and sort of more vocal, more activist approach uh, to atheism being taken and, and as represented by a number of very best-selling books and very prominent uh, personalities. And so I'll spend uh, a bit of time talking about trying to summarize a bit what the arguments of these new atheists are. And then I'll talk about after that the inadequacy of the responses to their arguments. Finally, and this will be mostly the next session, I'll talk about what I will propose to be elements in a new approach to dealing with the conflict between science and religion. And the elements will come from both the science side and the religion side. Um, coming from a, a background in physics, um, I'll spend uh, a fair amount of time talking about some new ideas in physics, new meaning the last century. Some, of, some new uh, discoveries, some new understandings about you know, the nature of the physical world as revealed by modern physics. I promise I won't use any equations, um, but I'll just try to de you know, de describe these advances in layman's terms. And then I'll try to put it together with some ideas uh, from the Baha'i writings that I, I believe are complementary with those and that together suggest really a revolutionary new way of thinking about the phenomenon of religion, the phenomenon of, uh, of revelation. So we are, in, in terms of the, the religious communities of mankind, we're, we're living increasingly uh, in a period of crisis. I'll say crisis because ever since really the dawn of the age of reason uh, and the scientific revolution several centuries ago, mankind has been more and more thrust out of the position of the center of the universe, which he had occupied from the dawn of history. Really throughout human history, we have been convinced that we were at the center of the universe. Both spatially, we believed that the world was flat and even when we believed when we understood that the world was round we believed that the sun and all the planets circled around the earth and of course all the stars and everything else uh, circled around the earth but more importantly we saw ourselves at the center of the universe in a more metaphysical sense as well that everything was created solely for our sakes and this understanding of the centrality uh, of uh, of man at, uh, in, in relation to the universe was displaced, uh, jarringly displaced, uh, by two movements in particular in modern science. The first of these was cosmology. Uh, it was as early as the 14 and 1500s that uh, astronomers and thinkers first began to look into the night sky and to get the idea that perhaps the earth was not quite the center of things. Actually, you could go all the way back to some of the ancient Greeks who also had these ideas, but it wasn't until just a few hundred years ago that evidence actually began, began to mount that the earth was not at the center of the universe. And in fact, not only was the earth not at the center of the universe, but the earth was infinitesimally small compared to the vast size of the universe. The first, really the, the first stage in this understanding came when 
when some of the first astronomers, uh, Bruno was one of the was one of the first, an Italian astronomer, realized, came up with a hypothesis, that those points of light in the sky outside were actually just like our sun, but they were so far away that they they simply appeared as points of light. And through, and this was a major revolution. This this was this made us very uncomfortable to realize how small we were in relation to the vastness of the cosmos. And of course, later on in the 20th century, when we understood not only was the sun simply a star like millions, hundreds of millions of other stars, but that all the stars that we could see comprised a single island universe, uh, a galaxy, a single galaxy. And we were simply at some corner of some otherwise unremarkable galaxy in the universe, which contained hundreds of millions of other galaxies. And there was no identifiable center to it all. Mankind became increasingly relegated spatially to some you know, forgotten corner of some otherwise unremarkable uh, part of what may end up uh, being, and, and the, the jury is still out on this, a spatially infinite universe. Like all we can say is that the more we look, the more galaxies we see. The farther out we look, the dimmer the light becomes and the harder it is to see. We don't see, obviously, an edge to the universe. Um, and the jury is still out, actually, whether it continues on until infinity or whether it wraps in on itself or, or in some other configuration. But it's vast indeed. And, the, and so the first of these two movements displacing us from, the, from our comfortable position at the center of the universe was cosmology. The second movement was far more wrenching. Um, and this movement was initiated by a fellow by the name of Charles Darwin. Darwin had the idea in the mid 19th century that life on Earth has, and the emergence of life on Earth has a rational explanation, has an explanation that can ultimately be um, reduced to a few basic principles, uh, uh, principles of natural selection, uh, principles of genetic variation, and so forth, as Darwinian theory advanced and as the structure of the, of the human genome became known and so forth, we understood more and more that there is a possible mechanism, a purely natural mechanism, by which human life can evolve. Of course, this mechanism is something that is, it, it, it's not as if it requires a designer at the beginning to set this thing in motion. In other words, it's a purely natural mechanism. It doesn't seem to require any sort of higher intelligence to get it moving. All it requires is uh, the right mix of chemicals, the right kind of uh, stable system over, over a period of time, and a very long period of time for it to happen. And so we f have found ourselves in the, in the present century displaced from this, uh, from this position of, of, the, of the center. But more than ourselves being displaced from the center, God himself has also been dethroned, if you will, in the following sense. Up until fairly modern times, whatever we didn't understand about the universe, was chalked up to the activity of the gods. We didn't understand the phenomenon of lightning. It was Zeus with his thunderbolts. Uh, we didn't understand uh, the phenomenon of, uh, of d disease. It was death with his, uh, with his sickle and so forth. All of the natural processes which we didn't understand were personified by various divine agencies. With the onward march of science, however, our understanding of the world around us gradually consolidated. And it was found that this idea of divine activity, the idea that the divinity or divinities are those beings that sort of make the world around us work in the ways that we can see but not understand, that picture of the divine gradually became obsolete as 
science came to be able to describe to greater and greater detail and with a greater and greater degree of completeness all of the phenomena that we could observe um, and everything that we could measure around us. So this, uh, this idea of the divine as the being that explains the unexplained uh, comes under the, the name, which you may or may not have heard before, of the god of the gaps. There are gaps in our understanding, and this god of the gaps fills in the gaps in our understanding. So one way to put this displacement of the divine uh, in the modern age is to say that the god of the gaps has gradually been squeezed out because there are very few gaps left. Very few gaps left in modern science. We still don't understand the nature of consciousness. We still don't understand you know, the why of the laws of physics. Why are they the way they are? How, uh, how did the universe uh, come into being in the first place? There are theories about that, but there's a few gaps left. These may end up, of course, being significant. But compared to the, our vast uh, ignorance of the way things worked up until relatively modern times, there's very little wiggle room left for, uh, for that sort of a divinity to, to operate. And so from the perspective of a modern day scientist, it's not so much that God's existence has been disproven as much as it has been shown to be, in a sense, superfluous. Someone, uh, it was, I think, the mathematician um, Laplace was showing Napoleon uh, a model of the universe that had been created, uh, one of these mechanical models where you turn the crank and the, and the, and the planets revolve around the Earth and you can predict the, the uh, position of the planets and the moon at different times. Um, it was, it's called an ori, at least one, one, way, uh, one word for it. It's, and uh, Laplace was showing Napoleon this thing, and Napoleon said, "Yes, but but who made, you know, but who made this, you know, this contraption, uh, or didn't God make this contraption?" Uh, and Laplace responded, "I have no need for that hypothesis." <laughs> so it really it sums up this I this idea, which is really has has come to be be the really dominant uh, paradigm uh, in science that the idea of God is no longer a necessary hypothesis. Uh, it's, it's sufficient for us to explain the world solely in terms of these uh, constant mathematical laws. And whatever complexity, whatever we still don't understand, even things as vastly complex as human consciousness itself, ultimately, even though we don't understand the ins and outs of it, it gets sort of put into a black box and said, well, we'll understand that someday once, we, once our science progresses, then we'll ultimately come to an understanding uh, of things as opaque to us today uh, as human consciousness. So not only has the advance of modern science made the idea of divine action a very problematic thing from the point of theology, but it's also made belief in God a difficult thing from another perspective. Um, and this goes under the word theodicy. Theodicy is a technical term uh, in, in theology, which basically means the problem of evil. That's one way to, to summarize what theodicy is. It's the problem of belief in an omnipotent and all-powerful and a benevolent God in the face of the existence of evil. This problem, because if God what if assuming God is good, God would want to remove the pain and suffering that, that people on earth exist. If this pain and suffering exists, and if God wants to remove it, but cannot, and that's why we have this pain and suffering, uh, then God is not omnipotent. So there's a problem of the idea of a loving and caring God, of a loving and caring deity. It's seemingly incompatible with a world that is dominated by suffering and with a constant struggle for survival in which all are eaters or eaten. And the advent of modern evolutionary theory has really sharpened that problem of theodicy because it's becoming more and more clear from, uh, from the point of view of evolutionary biology that life got here through this process of constant struggle 
through a, a cold and pitiless process of constant struggle where, where really suffering and pain are the dominant keynotes. And in that sort of a universe, the problem of the existence of, an, of a benevolent God and the simultaneous existence of so much pain and suffering uh, uh, is to many uh, an issue. Now, from a Baha'i perspective, of course, we have answers to this. We have uh, perspectives on this. Uh, Mr. Nakshivani mentioned earlier this morning in relation to why the chaos, why, why so much suffering in the name of religion. And Mr. Nakshivani gave us the example of the, um, it was the, uh, the ocean or the, the, the river, I can't remember what, you know, the vast body of water that rushes through and, and, and plows down old structures. It, prou- it, it is destructive as well as life-giving. Um, and that's one approach. Um, to that, but I'll get into a, more elements of a Baha'i response later on. What I'm trying to do is set is setting up the problem, setting up that in the mind of people today who see the success of science and who are really convinced of the validity of the scientific enterprise, the old notions of God and old notions of religion are becoming are coming under a certain amount of pressure. Now, what are some of the responses that have been made to this state of tension, to this state of pressure um, between religion as traditionally understood uh, and science uh, as, uh, as it exists? There's a few different responses, and these can be classified in a few different categories. One response is to say, well, science and religion actually don't contradict each other, they don't conflict with each other, because they're like strangers, they can coexist as long as they keep a safe distance from each other. Religion has its own sphere, it tells us how to live, and science has its own sphere, it tells us how things work. And as long as we keep these two spheres separate, then everyone will get along fine. That's one approach to resolving the conflict between science and religion. This approach is somewhat problematic, however, because there is overlap between them. You can't deny that there is a degree of overlap, that religion also tells us something about how the world is. It doesn't just tell us about how we should live, it also tells us something about the structure of reality. And on the other side, science also can have something to say uh, about how we should live our lives. It's possible that there is is an, an area of overlap Uh, between them. And it's inevitable, I think, that there will be an area of overlap between them. Not only because of of the nature of the two, but because if religion ultimately is a reflection of reality itself, then why should it be occupy a different sphere than science? Why should we see religion and science as being two different domains? Aren't they both ultimately describing the same reality, but from a different perspective? I'll get into that point more, uh, more tomorrow. So this, this is one response to this tension between science and religion, and, and this is to say, well, let's just keep them independent. But that's a problematic response. Another response goes under, uh, popularly goes under the name of intelligent design. Uh, I don't know how many people have heard of intelligent design, or intelligent design theory. People, if you've, if you've read a few re- books or articles recently uh, on, on the subject of science and religion, you might have heard that there is a group of people who have education in, in science, but who are committed, at the same time, they're committed Christians. And they accept uh, the, the, the reality of evolution up to a point, but they, they believe that it will come to a point where we won't be able to explain how the complexity of life arose. We can explain how life evolves maybe over the course of millions, even billions of years. They have no problem accepting that the earth you know, could be billions of years old and not a few thousand years old like some uh, creationists believe. But they'll say in the end, we're going to have to appeal to some other agency to explain the complexity of life. 
for instance, they, they point to uh, even the, some of the smallest bacteria, some of the smallest microorganisms, the little ones with the little tail that whips around and that swims through, the, swims through the, the algae and eats out, that sort of a thing, the paramecium and so forth. You look at the, the structure of the tail and how the tail moves, it's structured just like an outboard motor with all sorts of little shafts and rotors and these sorts of things. It looks like a small machine, really. And they look at this and they say, look, this could not have come into being through some natural process. It couldn't have come into being through a sequence of gradual steps. There had to have been a designer. There had to have been some sort of blueprint out of which you know, this outboard motor of the, of the bacteria's tail has been stamped. Ultimately, though, this idea of things, which may at first view sound enticing or sound like, well, maybe, maybe that's what the Baha'i writings would say as well, because we also believe that there's the interaction of the divine with creation. So maybe this is that point. Maybe this is where God interacts. Maybe this is where the finger of God touches, uh, touches creation. But this idea of irreducible complexity is also coming under a great deal of, of pressure um, by the onward march of our understanding of evolution. And there are it has been shown there are plausible mechanisms by which these seemingly irreducibly complex things can come into existence. The human eye, such an amazingly complex thing, made of all of these different parts. You take away one part and you can't see. You're absolutely blind. How can you imagine that such a thing can come into, uh, can come into existence through a series of gradual steps? But evolutionary biology has shown that the eye is actually developed on, on parallel lines and a number of different organisms. The octopus has its own eye, which was actually developed uh, completely separately from the human eye. In other words, there's, they've, they've proposed that there, are, that there are natural mechanisms by which these very complex things can come into, can come into being. Ultimately, though, I, this intelligent design theory and, and other theories similar to it all suffer from a similar problem. The problem is they are all different versions of the God of the gaps. They all, in different ways, ultimately, if you push them against the wall, they'll ultimately say that there's some unexplained part of the universe, and that unexplained part of the universe ultimately can only have God as the explanation. Only the activity of a divine being can explain how this little piece of it came into existence. The rest of it, we can go with the laws of nature, but this little piece of it, we have to appeal to a higher being. And that kind of a position, this God of the gaps position, is always under threat of being squeezed out of existence. Maybe next year, maybe 10 years from now, maybe a century from now, we'll actually find the mechanism. Well, maybe we'll actually discover that mystery. We'll fill in that remaining gap. And then wh what happens to our belief in God when, the, when, when that happens? So this is the second possible response to, um, to the science-religion conflict, to try to keep, you know, to, to, to hold out for some sort of, uh, of solid, tangible evidence uh, for, the, for the divine, which is not going to be under threat of the advance of science. A third response to the tension between science and religion uh, goes under the name conflict. That is, you simply conclude that they're incompatible. You have to throw out one or you have to throw out the other. Um, on the one hand, of course, um, there are fun, uh, literalists, you know, biblical literalists, uh, uh, Quranic literalists uh, in the East and in the West, uh, those who read scriptures in a, in, a, in, a, in a very literal way and conclude that the earth is a few thousand years and that we simply have to throw out these results of modern science. Um, there are more eloquent exponents of, of effectively a creationist uh, viewpoint. Um, some you know, talk about the need to return to some primordial religious tradition, uh, implicitly rejecting the, all the advances uh, of the modern world and of modern science. And these, on the surface of it, also sound very enticing. They sound like a lot of the truth has been captured by this because some of these writers, uh, I'm talking about a school of writers called the traditionalists. 
they're, they may not be that, that well known, um, but they're fairly influential in their, in, uh, in their own sphere. Their idea is that there does exist this primordial tradition that is shared by both East and West. All the, the Abrahamic religions, the Eastern religions, Buddhism, Taoism, Hinduism, and so forth, they all share some common spiritual core. And what they propose is that we return to this common spiritual core. Of course, the Baha'is believe this as well. We, we also believe that there is this common spiritual core to the world's religions. But this group of people have to throw out all of modern science uh, to get to that point. And the reason they have to do that is because they haven't realized that to be able to embrace modern science, as the Baha'i writings say we should, and at the same time to maintain our core beliefs, we have to think about certain fundamental categories in fundamentally different ways. And that's, that will be mostly the subject of, um, of, uh, of tomorrow's uh, talk. But I'll go on and continue to, uh, to set up this, uh, this conflict. Because the second of, the, um, of those who say it's simply incompatible, religion and science are incompatible, sort of opposite to the creationists, you have the, uh, what's, what I'll call the new atheists. They reject religion completely, and they reject belief in God completely. I should say at the outset that when I talk about atheism and when I talk about responses to atheism, you can have different things in mind when you hear the word atheism. Um, for, for many people, the word atheism is virtually synonymous with nihilism. It's like, well, you're an atheist, you don't believe in anything. You don't believe, you know, you believe there's basically no meaning or no sense or no purpose. That's not what I mean when I, when I talk about atheism. Uh, when I talk about it, I, uh, what I have in mind is a, a, a more of a considered rejection of God and religion as traditionally conceived. Um, and not necessarily just a sort of, you know, I don't believe in anything. These new atheists uh, come in the form of uh, several very prominent authors and, uh, and obviously less prominent people. The most prominent of the four uh, have been dubbed the four horsemen of the apocalypse <laughs> by nervous theologians, no doubt. Um, uh, Richard Dawkins, Chris Hitchens, Dan Dennett, uh, Sam Harris, you might have read some of their books. They write very eloquently, they write very persuasively, and they write very uncompromisingly uh, in, in their rejection of both God and religion. What I'd like to do is try to summarize a f in, in as, as quickly as possible, but I wanted to give enough time to sort of really paint the picture of the depth of, the, of their arguments against God and religion. I want to summarize a bit of, about what they're saying. Briefly, the arguments of the, the new atheists boil down to sort of a two-pronged attack. They call into question, on the one hand, the existence and the coherence of, uh, the existence of God and the coherence of the idea of belief in God. And on the other hand, they call into question the legitimacy of religion and the viability of religion in the modern age. So let me take God first and then religion second, and then I'll look at how people have responded to, uh, to their attacks. Uh, and, then, um, and then later I'll look into these, uh, the possible elements in a, in a different approach to the response. So on the subject of God, they have a few points that they would like to make. The first of the points is that the way that, that God has been understood traditionally is such that it's an absolutely extraordinary claim that there's this divine being that, that interferes in the operation of the world on a daily basis, if not momentary basis. That there is a loving, compassionate being uh, who watches over us, who listens to our prayers, occasionally performs miracles and so forth. These authors point out that to claim that such a being exists is an extraordinary claim. And it's an extraordinary claim that impinges upon the physical world. And extraordinary claims require extraordinary 
standards of evidence, extraordinary standards of scientific proof. In other words, they turn God into an actual hypothesis, a hypothesis about the physical world. They say, well, if you believe this being exists and this being is interacting with the world in tangible ways, then prove it, in other words. Show me the evidence. Because otherwise, you know, if the being exists and isn't interacting with the world, then why bother? Why bother believing in it? If this being exists and is interacting with the world, then let's, let's you know, let's see where that, exactly that interaction is happening. Let's actually go and look for it. And they claim that when it comes uh, to the proof that there's a, no, a lack of tangible evidence. Because any, any po anything you can point to, they can say any, you know, well, what about human consciousness? What about love? What about beautiful sunsets? Um, I mean, any sort of, uh, of evidence you can bring. What about the inner feeling that I have? They can, for any one of these, they can say, well, maybe there's a physical explanation. They might not be able to exactly explain it, but they can at least say, well, perhaps it's just this. Perhaps this is just the wiring of your brain. Perhaps this is just your social, uh, your, your social upbringing that's le led you to feel this way. Perhaps there's a physical explanation for this, uh, for, uh, for this phenomenon and so forth. So the one point they make is that if you're going to assert the existence of, divine, of a divine being, then you need to be able to prove it according to the standards of science. The second, a second point that we find them making on the subject of God is to say that, it, it, this is in particular in response to this intelligent design movement, this, this group of people who say that, well, there's irreducible complexity and that's where we can point to the operation of the divine in the world. Um, and their argument there is that, um, uh, as I've already sort of brought up, that evolution uh, can potentially explain how all life, even the most seemingly complex life, um, can be gradually formed over long periods of time through the operation of simple physical laws. In other words, it's not necessary, they would say, to postulate the existence uh, of such a being because we have at our disposal these various tools which can, which can potentially explain it. So, that, so that's uh, an argument that, that is made contra this, uh, this argument about um, complexity and how that may indicate the existence of God. A third point they make is that they say, aside from the, the constitution of our bodies themselves, aside from the question of how we got here physically um, through, through evolution or whatever mechanism, they argue that our innate sense of morality, our drive towards transcendence, our experience of the sublime through prayer and meditation can successively be explained in terms of evolution, psychology, and ultimately brain chemistry. They have no proof for this. Um, at this point, it's, it's writing blank checks on unknown accounts. It's saying, well, we have this very powerful set of tools, the scientific method, the instruments of science, and we have a lot of faith that we're ultimately going to explain all of these things. And so they take some of these things and they put them into this category. You know, they put them in the black box and they say, this is all going to be understood. Um, so it's not, it's not an entirely satisfying uh, argument that they have, um, but it's one that it's hard to argue against it. Uh, it's hard to argue against it given the past history of this phenomenal advance of science and ultimately explaining what, ultimately, uh, what originally uh, was unexplainable. So briefly, they argue on this point about the existence of God that, the, um, that this God of the gaps has been squeezed out and that there's really no need uh, for that hypothesis of the design. And even in the case of the, the, the grand designer, even in the ultimate question of how did the universe get here, you, you have to explain the existence of the universe in the first place. And where do you go with that? <coughs> Um, you might think that's the last bastion, that's the last place where you have to invoke some sort of creator in order to bring creation into being, to explain how we have something instead of nothing. Even the role that God would play in, as, as, a, as a creator in that sort of a, of a sense ultimately is sort of 
taken away by a, a deft twist of physical, uh, of, of physical theory that postulates that the universe, as special as it may seem, is actually not all that special because an infinite number of other universes have, have been created in parallel to ours. We'll never see them. They're there, but we'll never see them. And this infinite number of other universes all have slightly different values of, say, the gravitational force, or slightly different formulation of the basic laws of physics. But basically that all possibilities have been generated, again through a completely natural process, so that when you look at this universe and how special it seems, and how amazingly suited to the existence of life and consciousness it may appear, they say, well, there are other parallel universes that don't have any life in them. And the reason why our universe seems so special is that we're here to observe it. If it wasn't that special, we wouldn't be here to observe it. Sort of circular logic. But that's actually the reasoning that goes on in the highest circles in the, in the, in the cosmology community, for, for, for example. That it's a way of avoiding coming to the ultimate conclusion that all of the physical processes ultimately can end in a single generative point. Instead, it says that there may be an infinite number of these points. Now, I'm not saying that the, that the Baha'i position is one or the other of these, because I think the answer may be a little bit more subtle. We might think, well, obviously, we must believe that the universe was created by this that our universe was created by an act of a creator. But it will get more complicated than that, as I'll go into more detail uh, tomorrow. Just briefly, one could ask the question, couldn't it be the case that God is an infinitely creative God, and that there are parallel universes, that there are other, other realms of which we have no knowledge, of which we could never even conceivably describe or reach, because if, if God has created this universe in all its vastness and complexity, but still it's limited in the sense that gravity is a certain strength, and the electromagnetic force is a certain strength, and the laws of physics are a certain structure, perhaps there are other possibilities that could be unfolded by a different formulation of these laws of physics, but it requires other universes to do it. In other words, who is to say? We don't know whether it's one or the other because this is beyond the reach of science now, this is into metaphysics, but who is to say that the idea of God is not compatible with the idea of there being an infinite number of parallel universes? It's equally compatible, of course, with the idea of this one universe that was created, um, especially for, uh, for life, or even especially for human life. That's one of these questions that we have to, at, the, uh, at this point, sort of uh, step aside from. So those are a few of the arguments that we hear uh, made, by, um, made by atheists today in, re in response to the idea of the existence of God, the coherence uh, of the existence of, uh, of a supreme being. Let's turn now to their discussion of religion. So having to their own satisfaction uh, dispensed with the idea of God, they now turn to religion and they really have a field day here. Um, they really, uh, and they have a lot of material to work with, unfortunately. <laughs> and they can build their case on a wealth of examples, arguing, first of all, that religious institutions and the texts that they are based on are often man-made. The texts themselves may be complete fabrications, complete creations, or add mixtures of what may have been the original words of a prophetic figure with a human edition. They argue that the institutions that were formed after them are completely crafted out of whole cloth, completely made out of, uh, generated essentially out of thin air by our own, by, by ourselves. They argue secondly, and this is an, an obvious one, Mr. Nakshivani mentioned this this morning, that religion has been responsible for so much death and suffering throughout the ages. Um, if, if possible, more today even than ever in the past. And if one wants to follow the, the 
advice of Jesus when he said, by their fruits ye shall know them, then who can blame people who look at the state of religion today and the amount of suffering that is generated in the name of religion and say, is this the fruit? Is this, does this prove the reality of religion? Of course, it takes different sorts of, from a Baha'i point of view, it takes a different set of eyes. It takes the eye of insight to look beyond these hollowed out shells and to look beyond this dead underbrush of the old to see those green shoots, to see those seedlings of a new civilization which are just starting to poke above the surface, which are largely invisible still, but you have to have this uh, a very keen eyesight to see them coming and to realize that, that this decline of religion, um, it's a cyclical thing. And understanding that we're at the lowest point of this cycle and at the beginning of a new cycle is, uh, is one way of understanding how it is that something which should be so sublime, something which should be creating such joy and unity and peace and happiness is instead, uh, instead appears to be the cause of so much, uh, so much suffering. Thirdly, they argue uh, against religion that, well, religious laws are, out, are outdated. Religious social laws are outdated, if they were even relevant in the first place, they would say. Looking at the laws of marriage, looking at all sorts of, of you know, the laws, uh, dietary requirements, and so forth, you can look at any of the existing uh, religious systems and find a multitude of examples of laws and ordinances which simply are not practical, which simply are, could not be executed or, or carried through in their totality in this day, or which would involve a violation of other basic principles, like the vi a violation of the principle of the equality of the sexes and so forth. So many of the, of, the, of the laws and ordinances of former times are simply no longer suited to this day. Up until this point, you might feel, hold on, I'm agreeing with all these points. <laughs> but that's exactly the point that, uh, that we're going to come to. Fourthly, they argue that religion has historically been in conflict with reason and has impeded the progress of science. This is another very easy thing to argue. Look at Galileo, the persecution of Galileo by the church, uh, the burning of uh, Bruno at the stake, and, and, and so, many other, uh, so many other examples of the suppression of science uh, in, uh, in, in recent centuries by uh, organized religion. And finally, they argue, and this is, this is something they have no proof for, but this is what they argue, is that religion is in any case irrelevant to the modern age because an ethical life can be lived without religion. Now, we may contest that, and we may actually say, well, you may think you're living your ethical, maybe, because maybe there are people there who don't, maybe there are people in the world, and there are many people in the world who live a good, upstanding life, who, who do good works, who have an expansive view of, uh, of the world, who are working towards world peace, but they don't believe in God. They don't believe in religion, but they believe in these principles. What are we to do about those people? Abdu'l-Baha actually answers this question. Um, and what are we to do about these people? You know, what is our position regarding these people? <laughs> Someone asked Abdu'l-Baha that precise question, and it, it's in the final chapter of some answered questions. So what is the, what's the deal here? You know, for people who are so good, and they're doing so many great things in the world, but their lives are not oriented around God and religion. Uh, and Abdu'l-Baha has an answer to that. I'm not going to give, uh, and w one answer, and this is not Abdu'l-Baha's answer, uh, one answer to this is that even sometimes when you think that you're doing something without reference to religion or God, it's, it's simply a part of the air we breathe. The, the religion has brought, uh, has, has been instrumental in bringing to us in this day our notion of the freedoms that we enjoy and with which we're able to deny God and religion. But when we do so, we're doing so breathing the air that has been generated by religion and by, uh, through the influence uh, of, of, of an inspiration of religion over the, over the centuries. Anyway, I don't want to get into the, I'm sort of jumping ahead of myself a bit here uh, and getting to the sort of rebuttal of the, of the rebuttal. 
But I want to end there. I don't want to sort of drag this on too long. But this hopefully gives a bit of a, uh, a little bit of a perspective on what exactly are atheists saying? What exactly are they saying about belief in God? How are they trying to deconstruct belief in God? Uh, and how are they trying to deconstruct uh, belief in religion and the, uh, the idea of religion as a, as a, a viable uh, social force in the world? <coughs> Now I have until 12. Okay, so I'll, I'll finish this, this section and then for the new approach we're going to have, uh, uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, talk about that tomorrow. But what I wanted to conclude with today is to talk about the inadequacy of the response to the new atheists, to set up how we might think of a different way of responding to it tomorrow, both from the side of uh, physics and from the side of the Baha'i writings. People have, on the side of, um, on the side of belief in God, the, and I've already touched upon this, but it just bears reiterating, that for many people, they're really holding out for some sort of tangible proof. The, the, intelligent, the intelligent design uh, camp is, is, is a great example of this, of people who still ultimately believe that eventually science is going to find that God particle. We're eventually going to discover that, you know, that particular wiring of the human brain or something that represents that connection between the divine uh, and, and the world of matter. Um, this idea actually goes back several, several centuries. Um, the French philosopher Descartes uh, was one of the founders of the, uh, of the idea of dualism, the idea that there are material things, there's material stuff, and there's spiritual stuff. And these are two fundamentally different kinds of substances. Um, how do they interact? He wasn't sure, but he had a theory that in the center of the brain, there was a gland called the pineal gland. And his theory was that matter and spirit intersected somewhere deep in the brain in this uh, in, in this uh, pineal gland. So that sort of shows how little we understood. We still actually don't understand what the pineal gland does, I don't think, if there are any brain people in the audience. I still, we, we understand so little about the, about the brain, but I think we're pretty sure now that the pineal gland is not the magical sort of gate between the physical and the spiritual world. But it's that kind of thinking which still persists. There's still that kind of thinking that persists, that somewhere we're going to find uh, on a particular reading of, a, of an instrument or a particular setting on the dial, we're going to find that evidence for the existence of a higher being. Um, as, as you can probably guess by how I'm saying it, um, I'm going to call that way of thinking into question uh, in tomorrow's section and ask, is this really what we're looking for? Is this really the kind of God that we're looking for and the kind of God that we uh, believe in? So on the side of religion, people have made a number of, uh, of attempted responses. And these attempted responses, I think, have all really fallen short. They've argued, for instance, that, well, the atheists, they're taking the extreme. They're taking the very worst cases. For instance, the you know, suppression of, of uh, rights, suffering and death in the name of religion, wars, and so forth. And they're proceeding as if it were the normal thing. Um, in other words, they're attacking a straw man. They're attacking something which is not really the reality of religion. But great things are done in the name of religion, which is true. But ultimately, it only sort of blunts the attack a little bit. It doesn't really get at the, it doesn't address the reality of all of the terrible things that are and have been done in the name of religion. They argue that, um, they argue from anecdotal evidence. You know, as we all know, they have spectacular material you know, to work with. They have the Crusades, they have the Inquisition, they have 9-11, they have child sexual abuse scandals in the clergy and so forth. All of these, they would say, are just the, the extreme uh, examples. But in reality, religion does much good in the world, which I don't think we would disagree with. Um, but ultimately, it's not really an answer. It's not a proper answer. They argue from anachronism. They say, well, the atheists are retroactively applying our current value system on ancient cultures. And that does happen, you know, we, and, and you see these writers doing this a lot. They, they talk about Moses and the laws of the Torah as if it were the 20th century. And they say, well, it's ridiculous that God would say, do this, do that, do that. 
And of course it doesn't make sense in light of the changing needs of society in the modern age. But again, that's only a partial answer. Um, they argue also that you're mistaking cause and effect. They'll say, is it really religion that causes evil? Or is it just human nature? And religion is the excuse. Religion is the tool for, uh, for all of these things that are done in its name. But so these are just a few of the, uh, a few of the, of the responses that are given. And, but they all suffer from the same failing. And that is that they fail to really come to complete grips with the fact uh, that appallingly terrible things have been done and, and are being done in the name of religion. And to understand how it can be that religion is a viable force for today, uh, we have to have a different view, a fundamentally different view of religion, a fundamentally different view of what religion is, how it evolves, how it progresses through cycles of growth and decay. We also need to understand and to counteract arguments that, the, that uh, atheists make about the existence of God, we have to rethink what exactly do we, do we mean when we say the word God, when we refer to God. Uh, just, just to say a, a word or two in, in anticipation uh, uh, of what will be a, a, a larger point tomorrow. The Baha'i writings say unequivocally that, that God is beyond all names and attributes. Anything that we can think of God is not. And this, this goes to the most fundamental things which we think we can say about God. Abdu'l-Bahá in some answered questions says the divine reality is sanctified above singleness. How much more above plurality? Even saying God is one is itself, you know, oneness, plurality. These are all attributes of things, not attributes of that divine essence. And ultimately, when we understand the absolute abstractness, the absolute transcendence and unknowability of the creator, then some of these arguments against God's existence, as well as many of the arguments for God's existence, many of the traditional proofs that have been given for God's existence. There's a cosmological proof, an ontological proof, a teleological proof. There's all sorts of different categories of proofs for God's existence, all become almost no long, not, not necessarily, no, well, no longer valid in a technical sense. They still may retain usefulness as a way of indicating sort of the right direction to go. We get a sense that Abdu'l Baha did this in some answer questions. When in one of the early questions of some answer, uh, chapters of some answer questions, after giving one or two proofs, Abdu'l Baha says, These proofs have been adduced for weak minds, but if the eye of inner insight be opened, a hundred thousand clear proofs will become evident. So although even Abdu'l-Bahá often uses and brings out these uh, logical proofs for God's existence, we get the sense that even he might not have meant that these are valid in a precise mathematical sense, but rather these are indications. These are all gestures. These are fingers pointing at the moon. And to get from the tip of the finger to the moon, there's a very long distance indeed. And that distance has to be traversed by the intuition and not by reason. So that's all that we have time for today. Um, I hope that I haven't scared you off by technical talk. I sort of got into, a bit into the nitty gritty. But tomorrow I'm going to turn uh, half to, to modern physics, no equations, I promise, um, and half to glimpses of uh, a way forward, a third way, we'll call it, uh, from the Baha'i writings. Thanks for. <laughs> So yesterday I spent really the, the whole time setting up what hopefully will be a few constructive thoughts. Yesterday was more devoted to deconstruction in a sense. Um, I outlined um, what has over the past few centuries come to be increasingly a real crisis um, between religion and science, a real crisis, particularly uh, from the perspective of those who belong to traditional religious communities, a crisis because traditional ways of believing uh, about God uh, and religion have been eroded, um, apparently eroded, by the onward march of science. One, um, one prominent scientist has actually 
referred to Darwinian theory as a universal acid that dissolves all religious belief. That's the, the sort of mindset that many people have about some of the consequences in particular of, uh, of uh, Darwinian theory. So I talked a little, about, uh, a little bit yesterday about what, uh, what some of the arguments, uh, what some of those arguments have been, divided them generally into arguments concerning the existence of God, arguments concerning the uh, concerning religion um, as a as a social institution and its its sort of legitimacy and and whether it's outlived its usefulness. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit today is is suggest some uh, some possible just make a few gestures in the direction of a solution. I I, I can't obviously propose uh, any sort of systematic solution, but what I want to propose will be. Um, I think of it as, as fairly revolutionary, fairly um, thinking about things in, in, in fairly fundamentally new ways. There are others as well uh, beyond the Baha'i community who are also coming to the same uh, sort of conclusion that this kind of new thinking uh, will be necessary to move forward. Here's a summary from one prominent uh, theologian, actually, uh, by the name of John Hout. In a very recent book, he writes the following. Hasn't Darwin's evolutionary science placed in serious doubt the religious sense that we inhabit a meaningful universe? Or is it instead possible that what scientific skeptics often take to be the religiously ruinous consequences of Darwinian thought are, in fact, fresh openings to mysterious sacred depths of reality previously unfathomed. And in these depths, will we find only an abyss of absurdity, or perhaps instead the sustaining presence of a truly living and renewing God, one who can command the fullness of our worship, and one to whom we might still pray with love and confidence. So that's one example of a, of a, of a perspective from a non-Baha'i perspective of those who look at, the, at this current situation, which seems on the face of it so bleak from the perspective of religion and believes that there are ways forward. But these ways forward will involve thinking about things in a different way. It will involve a transformation in our perspective. So what I'd like to propose is the following that we begin with one of the fundamental Baha'i principles, and this is the principle of the unity of science and religion. Abdu'l Baha has stated, really in no uncertain terms, in Paris talks, he says, there is no contradiction between true religion and science. When a religion is opposed to science, it becomes mere superstition. The true principles of all religions are in conformity with the teachings of science. If we take that as a starting point, take our commitment to the belief that whatever we conclude will ultimately be in, uh, will ultimately be not only in accordance with science, but will also not involve any kind of backing away from or repudiation of the fundamentals of our religious belief. It will not involve any kind of backing away from the reality of that mystical connection between the soul and that which lies at the heart of all authentic spiritual traditions, that unknowable essence. How can we get both in the end that is the question that we'll be asking. And so we're going to try to go beyond what I've written up there and didn't properly explain yesterday, beyond this idea of Athens and Jerusalem. By Athens and Jerusalem, I mean a, a shorthand. Athens referring to the tradition beginning really with the ancient Greeks, the tradition uh, which has evolved today into modern science, the idea that the human mind 
is capable of understanding the world around it. That through the operation of our rational powers, we have the ability to understand, to determine not just how the world works, but how we should live. There's this stream of thought uh, with reason at its center, which, which, has been, which can be sort of summarized uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the metaphorical form of the city of Athens. And on the other side of it, historically, has been the city of Jerusalem the, with revelation at, this, at its center, uh, including and embodying the belief that we are not capable on our own of determining how we should live, determining how the world works, but we need to have that information given to us through divine revelation. These, this contradiction or this apparent contradiction and this tension between the idea that mankind is the arbiter of his own destiny through his own rational powers and the idea that mankind stands in constant need of a higher power to guide, uh, to guide him onwards and upwards. It's this apparent conflict between Athens and Jerusalem that we have to transcend. I will submit that in the end we will find that the idea that Athens and Jerusalem are separate cities is really a figment of our imagination. Ultimately, reason and revelation are one and the same. And I'll hopefully uh, be able to give a little bit, put a little more meat on those bones in the, in the remarks that, that I'll be offering um, this morning. What I wanted to do was to look first of all at a few ideas, a few very suggestive results from modern science, particularly from modern physics, that tell us unexpected things about the nature of the physical world. Um, I'll, the list could be quite long, but I'll, I'll confine myself, because of the, of the shortness of time, I'll confine myself to, to three sort of general topics. And then I'll talk about a few, maybe three uh, also ideas from the, from the Baha'i writings and try to connect them a little bit. So modern science has changed our understanding of reality in, in, in quite radical ways. Up until a century or two ago, the idea it, from from uh, the time of Newton until really the time of Einstein and the, the development of quantum mechanics. The idea was that science gave us a picture of the world as as atoms bouncing around in the in an empty void of space with there being really no uh, no concept, no place for the entry of consciousness of any sort of uh, power beyond uh, the mere operation, the physical operation of, of atoms, which can completely be described by the laws of mathematics. This idea of this, the, this, this picture of the world was overturned in certain, in certain fundamental ways. And the, the, the path by which these ideas about the universe were overturned the, the methodology and the, the, the single tool that scientists have used that has enabled them to unlock so many of the secrets of nature goes under the name, you might not expect this, the name of symmetry, the word symmetry. So I want to talk a little bit about symmetry and how important symmetry is as a concept that will ultimately also have potential applications uh, in, what, in the traditionally what we think of as the spiritual domain. Symmetry, to try to, it, it's best described by a few examples. Symmetry is, is the idea that a certain object or a certain configuration, a certain entity, um, or the, let me just give a few examples. A square, think of uh, a geometric 
figure of a square. The square is symmetrical in the sense that you can rotate that square by 90 degrees and you end up with exactly the same square. You can rotate it 90 degrees again and you end up with exactly the same square. You can reflect that square in space. You can turn it in, the, in three dimensions and again you end up with exactly the same square. It's a very simple intuitively clear idea. We all understand that much of symmetry. That in its basic, in the sort of the bare bones uh, a description, that's the, that's the heart of what symmetry is, that you, you can take an object, perform some operation on it, and you end up with the same thing. This idea, as simple as it sounds, has very profound applications in the study of the physical world. Profound and somewhat abstract applications. I'll give you a, a, a couple of concrete applications and then a couple maybe more abstract applications. One of the first applications of this principle of symmetry came when the first, not the first astronomers, but astronomers more in the, in the modern era, and I mentioned one yesterday, looked up in the sky and they realized that those points of light out in the night sky, if you translated those points of light, if you moved those points of light closer in, they would look just like the sun. And conversely, if you took the sun and moved it out farther away, it would look like, just like the stars. So there's a symmetry operation. You move the stars in closer, they look like the sun. You move the sun out farther, it looks like a star. An interesting consequence of that is that things which on the face of it seem to be very different through a simple operation end up actually being identical to each other. So that's one simple example of what we might call a symmetry operation. Let me give a more abstract example. There's an old story which many of us may have heard of Isaac Newton sitting under the apple tree. And he's sitting under the apple tree lost in thought and an apple falls from the tree onto his head. And from this, the theory of gravity is born. Well, how did he get to the theory of gravity from feeling the apple hit his head? In that moment, as the story goes, we don't know exactly when he had the idea, but as the story goes, at that moment, Newton realized that whatever force pulled that apple from the tree and hit his head is the same force ultimately that causes the planets to circle around the sun. The symmetry operation here being move the apple out into outer space and it'll do exactly the same thing as the planets are doing. So what he realized was that the power of gravity was a universal power. That, what, that, that force that keeps us on the earth is the same force that keeps the planets circling around the sun. This may seem very obvious to us now because we're used to learning in school about the force of gravity and it's not a new idea to us that what keeps us sitting on the floor is the same as what keeps planets circling around the sun. But at the time, that was a revolutionary idea and that led to a revolutionary and very powerful new way of describing one of the fundamental laws of physics. Let's move just one step more abstractly. Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, he has two different versions of the theory of general relativity, the theory of special relativity. Einstein realized, and he came up with the, uh, the realization, that the laws of physics are unchanged whether you are at rest or in motion. There's a symmetry operation. You take this entire room and send it off at some velocity, high velocity, low velocity, and as we're sitting in this room, we'll find that the laws of physics will not have changed to us. Everything will be measured in exactly the same way. From this perhaps obvious intuitive realization, Einstein was able to deduce the unity of space and time. I mean, from very simple ideas, from very simple thought experiments, you're able to extrapolate to unify different phenomena which may, on the face of it, have seemed to be very different from each other, if not 
incompatible. So symmetry has undergirded a great majority of the great and most important advances of modern physics. Let me give a couple examples of how this has led to a revolution in our thinking about the basic processes of the world. One of them is that cause and effect themselves become relative and incidental things. To, to get into the details of this requires talking about calculus, and I'll avoid talking about calculus, but I'll try to summarize in the following way. There's a way of mathematically describing the laws of physics in terms of particles and forces and accelerations. Things bump into each other, it causes a force, it causes something to move. The way you calculate how things move is by looking at the force on a thing at a particular instant, and then at the next instant in time, you recalculate the force on that, and then at the next instant in time, you recalculate the force on that. It's all written in terms of cause and effect. This instant in time is the cause of that next instant in time, and everything is formulated in terms of accelerations, forces, and so forth. There's another equivalent way of writing the laws of physics, um, a, a way that includes, to, put, to use the, the mathematical term, that, that, that includes using an integral formulation instead of a differential formulation. Uh, the details of that aren't important, but what's important is that they're mathematically equivalent. But from this other perspective of writing the laws of physics, things are no longer described in terms of causes and effects. Things are now described in terms of a system operating in such a way as to minimize some quantity. The system will operate such that the following thing happens. This is a very subtle but profound difference in formulating the laws of physics. From one point of view, everything is seen in terms of causes and effects. From another point of view, Things are seen in, the, in terms of the whole system is acting in order to minimize a certain quantity. Some of you may recognize in this a difference between a causal description and what is called in philosophy a teleological description. Teleology meaning an end directed process. Why is this important? Why am I talking about this here? Because I believe that this causal versus teleological picture, which is a purely mathematical consequence of, the, of a modern formulation of the laws of physics, could be usefully uh, mirrored in terms of our thinking about God's action in the world. How do we think about God's action in the world? We, th we think about God as being the direct cause of things. That's our, our way of thinking about the activity of the divine in the world. But from, from modern science, we find that this picture, this idea of thinking about things in terms of cause and effect is actually only one half. It's only one way of thinking about things. It's also possible to formulate things very precisely, very mathematically, in terms of a goal-directed process, which is oftentimes how we think about the, the, the activity of the divine in the world. God acts such that a certain thing will take place. What I'm suggesting here is that there's a result from modern physics that relativizes our very notion of cause and effect. And that can have an impact in how we think about the relationship between God and the world. I realize I've done a very inadequate job of, of describing all this, but I just wanted to give a sort of brief indication of, what, um, of, of where this might go. So cause and effect become part of, let, let, me, let me put it in the words of, of one physicist. He says it in the following way. From the perspective of modern science, 
the events don't have purposes or causes. They simply conform to the laws of nature. Believing otherwise is a relic of a certain metaphysical way of thinking. So aside from the relativity of cause and effect, another uh, major advance in modern physics, also deeply tied in with the principle of symmetry, was the discovery of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, um, uh, I'm not going to be able to describe it, even give you the, the, the in, in the time we have, I don't think I can do any justice to it whatsoever. But to say a couple of relevant facts about quantum mechanics, a, re a couple of relevant facts about the structure of things at the, at the level of the smallest particles. Quantum mechanics not only tells us that the most elementary particles of creation have, can sometimes act as particles and at other times act as waves, and how they act depends upon how you observe them. But also, one of the results of quantum mechanics is that the difference between, the distinction between the observer and the object being observed is complicated, to say the least. There's an example, a famous example, in quantum mechanics of a cat in a box. There's a cat in a box, and in this box is a, uh, a jar of poisonous gas. This jar of poisonous gas is sealed. But what will break the seal of this jar of poisonous gas is uh, the decay of a particular isot some particular radioactive isotope, some sort of plutonium, whatever you want it to be. The decay of this radioactive substance obeys the laws of quantum mechanics, which means it cannot, we cannot predict with any precision when that moment of, de of decay will take place. We can only say the probability at any given point that that decay will take place. So let's shut the box and the cat and this, and this lethal contraption up and then ask ourselves after a few minutes, is the cat alive or dead? And the answer is, from the perspective of quantum mechanics, the cat exists in a superposition of states. It's, there's a 50% chance it's alive, and there's a 50% chance that it's dead. And that's as far as science can go. That's as far as the description of it can go. But of course, the cat itself knows whether it's alive or dead. Surely, the cat itself knows whether it's alive or dead. This illustrates a basic problem, not, not a problem with the theory, because the theory works to, it's a very precise theory, and it's been tested and retested in every possible way. It's the interpretation of the theory which is still causing scientists and philosophers to spill um, jars and jars of ink over, it because no one really understands what the consequence of this is. But they do know, and I think everyone is in agreement on the point that quantum mechanics leads us to rethinking the distinction between the subject and the object, between the observer and the observed. In everyday life, we think these are very clear. I'm me, you are you, what could be more clear? But at a certain level of things, at a certain fundamental of things, the distinction between the observer and the observed actually breaks down and the two become entangled. The two become part of a single system. So these two ideas, both this relativity of cause and effect and this relativity of the observer and the observed, which are quite fundamental to the structure of existence as far as modern physics has been able to discover, I think could have profound implications for how we understand certain ideas um, in, the, in the religious domain, in the sphere of the, spirit, of, the, of the spiritual. So what are these ideas? And how might modern physics have something to say or something suggestive to say about them? So I'm turning now to the last, um, to the last section, glimpses from the Baha'i writings. 
The first of these ideas has to do with the nature of God. Traditionally, and, and I want to just refer briefly back to the, the popular conception of God that the new atheists and you know, atheists throughout time have been arguing against, and this is the idea of the God of the gaps. The idea that God is a being, like we are beings, uh, with, which is omnipotent, which has these various attributes, which acts directly in creation. In a, his hand is literally touching things. Um, and the atheists say, well, how can this be? If, is there, if this is true, there must be evidence for it. This is a, a stupendous claim. There must be uh, corresponding evidence for such a claim. And so the idea, this idea of God as agent, this idea of God as a, as a direct actor uh, has come under pressure by modern science. What do the Baha'i writings say about the nature of God? Baha'u'llah talks about God as being an unknowable essence. In one of his prayers he writes, at, at whatever time my pen ascribeth glory to any one of thy names, Methinks I can hear the voice of its lamentation in its remoteness from thee. I can recognize its cry because of its separation from thyself. Baha'u'llah describes in another prayer, he says, If I attempt to describe thee by glorifying the oneness of thy being, I soon realize that such a conception is but a notion which mine own fancy hath woven and that thou hast ever been immeasurably exalted above the vain imaginations which the hearts of men have devised. This is regarding the attribute of oneness itself. If we think of what, it, what could be the most fundamental thing we could say about God, we would say, well, there's one God and that God exists. We can say, at least we can say that much. But Baha'u'llah here is saying that even oneness itself is an attribute that we can understand. If we can understand it, then by definition, this attribute cannot apply to that unknowable essence, which must be beyond all attributes, beyond all names. Abdu'l-Baha puts it in the following way in some answer questions. He says that the divine reality is sanctified beyond singleness. How much more beyond plurality? There's a very important tablet of Abdu'l-Baha to Dr. Farrell, a Swiss entomologist. Uh, his life involved in the study of ants. <laughs> but he had very interesting questions for Abdu'l-Baha, questions about the nature of the soul, questions about the relationship between God and creation. And Abdu'l-Baha had the, the following to say to Dr. Farrell about the attributes of God, the reality of this divine essence. Abdu'l-Baha says, When we say that the divine essence understandeth and is free, we do not mean that we have discovered the divine will and purpose, but rather that we have acquired knowledge of them through the divine grace revealed and manifested in the realities of things. Elsewhere in the same tablet, he says that these attributes and perfections that we recount for that universal reality are only in order to deny imperfections rather than to assert the perfections that the human mind can conceive. Thus we say that his attributes are unknowable. The Bab goes even further, and he takes us into a completely different realm, I think. Uh, takes us to a completely different place when it comes to thinking about the reality of God and our relationship to it. First of all, the Bab addresses this issue of God's being in the following way. He says, no one hath ever been able befittingly to recognize him. Nor will any man succeed at any time in comprehending him as is truly meet and seemly. For any reality to which the term being is applicable hath been created by the sovereign will of the Almighty, who hath shed upon it the radiance of his own self. He's saying even whatever you, you say this exists, this has being, the Bab is saying that itself is a creation of God. The Bab goes even further in the following 
uh, in the following uh, passage. This one may really send you for a loop. <laughs> he who worshipeth God through anyone but him, by gazing at his own self as the worshiper, and at God as the object of his worship, hath joined partners with God, and hath never worshipped him. What are we to make of that in light of the fact that every Baha'i prayer is written from the language of the worshiper worshiping the worshipped? Our obligatory prayers tell us every day of our powerlessness and his might, of our poverty and his wealth. What are we to make of this dichotomy? Is this a contradiction in the writings? What are we, how are we to resolve it? It's these sorts of questions that uh, people would sometimes write to Shoghi Effendi and ask him. He says this here, but he says this here. What do we make of it? In one of his letters, Shoghi Effendi responds that the Baha'i writings are like a sphere. There are points, poles apart, and in between are the thoughts and doctrines that unite them. And somehow I think we have to understand this question in similar terms. The Baha'i writings are filled with references to a personal God. References to an active God, a God of history, a God, a prayer hearing, prayer answering God who is personally in our lives. At the same time, the Baha'i writings also contain many references to an invisible, transcendent, unknowable comp God completely detached from creation, who has no connection to creation. The merest suggestion of a connection with creation would be to reduce the, 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 the reality of God to the level of creation itself. What are we to make of these two poles? Baha'u'llah, in the opening pages of Gleanings, gives, I think, a, a, a suggestion of, to, to sort of continue one step beyond what the, what the Bab says about the worshiper and the worshipped, and how this idea of seeing ourselves as the worshiper and God as the worship is ultimately a form of shirk, a form of, of joining partners with God. Baha'u'llah says the following, which I think helps maybe point us in a direction uh, towards a resolution. This is in page four of Gleanings. He says, whatever duty thou, meaning God, hast prescribed unto thy servants of extolling to the utmost thy majesty and glory is but a token of thy grace unto them, that they may be enabled to ascend and to the station conferred upon their own innermost being, the station of the knowledge of their own selves. Baha'u'llah here seems to be saying that we are being asked, we are being directed and commanded to worship God as great, to worship God's attributes, not so much because we're worshiping an object, an entity that exists outside ourselves, like other people exist outside ourselves, but rather that the object is to discover that divine spark that lies within our own selves. And here we return to the, to the uh, Arabic hidden words of Baha'u'llah, where he says, turn thy sight unto thyself, that thou mayest find me standing within thee, mighty, powerful, and self-subsisting. So how can we understand then this Duality, these two different pictures of viewing God either as transcendent, completely detached, completely separate from creation, and as imminent, that is, within creation, active in creation, within our own selves. I think one possible, uh, one possible direction is to look at this phenomenon of symmetry, which we know is so pervasively found and so, so foundational to the structure of things in the physical world. And if, as Abdu'l-Bahá tells us, the physical and spiritual worlds are in fact mirror images of each other. Whatever exists in the spiritual world, there's a reflection of that in the physical world and vice versa. Could it not be the case that there's a symmetry principle at work as well in matters of the spirit? Could there be a symmetry operation, a translation of perspective that takes us from the transcendent God to the God of history, to the personal God. That's just a suggestion of, uh, uh, of how the two might, uh, might speak to each other. 
A second point, so the fir my first point on glimpses from the Baha'i writings is this idea of the nature of God and transcending the idea of God as object, um, uh, as object of our worship. If we follow the thread of this argument, if we say, okay, uh, we won't think of God uh, as you know, from this perspective, as we turn the sphere to this side and we're now looking at this hemisphere and for the moment the other hemisphere is out of sight. If looking at this side of, of things, we say, okay, we're not looking for uh, an active agent in the world. We're not looking for a God whose activity can be discerned by any kind of laboratory experiment, by any kind of physical measurement, by any sort of tangible measurable thing then how are we to find God? How are we to find God's activity in the world? Baha'u'llah in the Tablet of Wisdom gives us maybe a hint of an answer. And his answer may come unexpectedly because it's the exact inverse of the God of the gaps. It's rather the God of the filled spaces, if you will. It's the God of nature. Baha'u'llah says the following. Nature is God's will and is its expression in and through the contingent world. It is a dispensation of providence ordained by the ordainer, the all-wise. Were anyone to affirm that it is the will of God as manifested in the world of being, no one should question this assertion. It is endowed with a power whose reality men of learning fail to grasp. Indeed, a man of insight can perceive not therein save the effulgent splendor of our name, the Creator. Bahá'u'lláh well, here is talking about nature. He's talking about that part of the world that we do understand. In a sense, Bahá'u'lláh is saying, don't look for God in the gaps. Look for God all around us. Look for God within every atom. Look for God in the sun. Look for God in the beauty and symmetry of the world around us whose laws are a direct reflection of the will of the omnipotent in creation. Abdu'l-Bahá wrote a short commentary on the Tablet of Wisdom, and he affirms this. He says the following. Baha'u'llah says, it's a reiterating Baha'u'llah in the Tablet of Wisdom, it says, Baha'u'llah says that that nature which they, the, the scientists, consider to be the source of all beings is the manifestation of his creative name. It is the first cause that is the source of all beings and which has been interpreted as nature. The point is this. All the conditions and perfections that the philosophers attribute to nature are the same as have been attributed to the primal will in the Holy Scriptures. If that's not a revolutionary idea, I'm not, I'm not sure what is. Traditionally, we think of God and God's action as apart from nature. Nature does its thing until God intervenes. We think of God as an agency outside the normal operation of the laws of nature. Whereas the picture that we have here is rather that nature itself is an expression of that agency. Now, of course, we have to think about the definition of words. What does Baha'u'llah mean when he says nature? Is Baha'u'llah's definition of nature the same as what a modern-day scientist would call nature? Or is perhaps Baha'u'llah's definition of nature somewhat broader or more expansive to include things which we might think of as spiritual realities? And that's a point I want to get to. Uh, and I'll come to that point in, in, uh, in, in one moment. So Baha'u'llah, by defining nature, identifying nature with the primal will, perhaps is illustrating for us another symmetry principle. Nature and the primal will. On the one hand, what could be more different than the action of a loving and compassionate and omnipotent creator in the world and the mindless action of atoms and forces and fields that bring 
apparently nothing but pain and suffering into the world. If you, if you look at Darwinian theory, nature is simply an arena of pain and suffering of the eater and the eaten. How can that possibly be reconciled with the notion of a loving and compassionate creator? Could there be a symmetry principle involved? A very abstract one, of course, but one from which, from one perspective, we can say, yes, this is a, a, a description of the world which is complete from its perspective. But if you turn the sphere, if you rotate the sphere to the other side, you see things from another perspective. You see the operation of a loving providence in the world. What, what then would be the nature of that symmetry operation? Abdu'l-Baha gives us a picture of the world, and Baha'u'llah as well, but Abdu'l-Baha really crystallizes it for us. A picture of the world as an emanation of the Logos, an emanation of the Word of God. God, or, or if to use a, a, a term or a phrase that the uh, Islamic mystics use, that the world is an exhalation of the breath of the merciful. But that's only the first half of it. The, 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 the merciful exhales, uh, speaks the word be, and it is. But then the second half is the inhalation, the inspiration, which draws creation back to the creator. Abdu'l-Bahá refers to these as the Ark of Descent and the Ark of Ascent. And along the Ark of Descent and along the Ark of Ascent are numerous degrees. Abdu'l-Bahá refers to these as kingdoms of existence. He talks about the mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, the animal kingdom, human kingdom. He talks about the spirit of faith, the Holy Spirit. He talks about spiritual realms beyond the human kingdom and spiritual, or, well, let's call them physical realms for the moment, but uh, preceding the human kingdom. But what is spirit and what is matter? This is one of these ideas like God and religion, one of these ideas that we may need to rethink. Going back to yesterday's comment about Cartesian philosophy, Descartes had the idea that there's material stuff and there's spiritual stuff. Two kinds of things that somehow interact in the world. Could it be rather that what we call matter and what we call spirit can actually be translated into each other through a symmetry principle, through a symmetry operation? What would be the nature of that symmetry operation? Moving up or down along the arc of ascent along the, or, or along the arc of descent. Let me try to make that, that idea a little bit more clear. Abdu'l-Bahá in one of his tablets says, and this is a very profound, very profound idea, but stated in just a very few words. He says, to the vegetable, the animal is a spiritual reality. Of course, to us, the animal is a purely physical reality. But to the vegetable, it's a spiritual reality. It seems that what we call matter and we, what we call spirit may not be so much a matter of it being a different kind of stuff, but rather what we call spirit is when we're looking above us towards God, and what we call matter is whatever is below us. One way of thinking about re, re, reconfiguring, perhaps, our ideas about spirit and matter. Adabaha seems to confirm this in one of his great tablets called the Tablet of the Universe, which bewilders us in the scope of this statement. He says, earthly and heavenly, material and spiritual, accidental and essential, particular and universal, structure and foundation, appearance and reality, and the essence of all things, both inward and outward. All of these are connected with one another and are interrelated in such a manner that you will find that drops are patterned after seas and that atoms are structured after suns in proportion to their capacities and potentialities. Universal and particular are in reality incidental and relative considerations. Certain fundamental categories of our thinking end up being relative considerations. We aren't talking about relativism, we're talking about relativity. 
Relativism is to say, well, in that case, everything goes. In that case, there is no underlying structure to things. You say this, I say that. You know, we, we can't really decide amongst us. That's, that's, rel that's relativism. What we're talking about here is relativity, that there is a relativity of perspective from which, from one perspective, you can see God in creation, an agent in creation. From another perspective, you can see nature and nature's processes and mathematical laws. The two are one and the same. It's a matter of perspective. From one perspective, you can see matter, and, and from another perspective, you can see spirit, and so forth. This principle of relativity, <coughs> relativity of religious truth, Shoghi Effendi has called the fundamental, most fundamental teaching of the Baha'i Faith, the axis around which the teachings of the Baha'i Faith revolve this principle of the relativity of religious truth, which in one of its manifestations is, um, is seen in perhaps the more familiar idea of progressive revelation. And I wanted to end um, my comments uh, on this theme of progressive revelation. Progressive revelation is one aspect of the relativity of religious truth. And I think an understanding of progressive revelation and in particular, the cyclical nature of religion can help understand the attacks that are being launched against religion uh, by these new atheist authors and others. Attacks that are very well grounded. If you look at what is happening in the name of religion, if you look at what is happening in Iran potentially today, then we see and we have to admit to, the, uh, to so much of what these authors are saying when they attack religion as an institution. But at the same time, if we see and understand the organic nature of religion, religion itself evolves just as humanity itself has evolved physically over the eons. Religion evolves, but not in a linear sense. It evolves in cycles, just like the cycles of the seasons, cycles of birth and decay. And that we're, we're, where we are at now is it this deepest winter of unbelief? And we represent those tiny seedlings that, are, that, will, uh, that will eventually grow into the tallest trees. But with that perspective, it can help us understand and really agree with, in its own terms, so much of what these authors are saying, so much of how they're expressing their discontent with the idea of the belief, of belief in God with the idea of, of religion as a progressive organization, as a progressive force for change. With these concepts, we can perhaps help to forge a new language, to forge a new conceptual framework from which um, we can uh, better explain uh, uh, the, the, the Baha'i revelation. At, at, the, at the very beginning, um, or towards the beginning, Yesterday, I mentioned this, um, this statement by one, of the, by one of these prominent authors that the idea of God is an extraordinary claim and it requires extraordinary proof. And in part, my answer is, well, he's looking for proof for the wrong kind of God. Um, if you believe in a, in a God of the gaps, then I don't think you're going to find that sort of a proof. But there is another kind of extraordinary proof which we can offer, um, not a logical proof, certainly, but the proof of transformation. Ultimately, I think it's the, my, me personally, you know, in, in my way of looking at it, it's the transformation of, per, of people and the transformation of societies which offers the best proof of the validity of any particular spiritual message. Baha'u'llah himself says, as much in the Kitab i uh, I don't have the quotation with me, but he says, if the character of mankind be not changed, the futility of God's universal manifestation would be proven. Which places upon the Baha'i community, I think, an enormous burden and enormous responsibility. I guess burden is the wrong word, enormous privilege, and enormous responsibility to make ourselves an example of that change that we, that we want to make in the world, to make ourselves the living proof 
of the reality of Baha'u'llah's revelation. Thank you very much.